<laughs> Y'all know what it is. to a very exciting episode of Eggs. Today's special guest is world-renowned turntablist and DJ, Hubert. Hubert, not to be confused with the jumpy orange fellow, is widely acknowledged as one of the most innovative turntablists in the world. The San Francisco-born DJ has pioneered several highly complex scratching techniques, including the infamous crab scratch, with a heavy emphasis on rapid, percussive movements as well as conceptual usage of spoken word samples. In addition to proper albums and mixtapes, he's released countless DJ battle records and instructional videos, as well as launching an online DJ school. Hubert is without a doubt an innovator and an OG in the space, and to be honest, there are simply too many accolades to list them all here. So let's just get on with the show, shall we? So please join us in welcoming to the show, the incredible, the talented Hubert. Hey man, how are you? Hey, how's it going guys? Absolutely great! Thanks so much for taking the time to do this. It's a it's late in the evening uh, on a, on a Wednesday night, and uh, and you suppose us in. I, I love it. Thank you so much. So, um, we like to go back and get the history of, of people's careers, and yours spans many decades. And um, I actually want to go back even further. Mm-hmm. Um, your parents are immigrants from the Philippines, correct? From Bacolod. Yeah, my mother's from the uh, south uh, in Bacolod, and my father's from the north in uh, Ilocos. So, did, were you born there, or did you uh, were you born stateside? Uh, San Francisco. San Francisco. Uh, yes. So I actually um, I spent some time in the Philippines. I I lived in uh, Tacloban, and I, I learned some. Whoa, Versailles. where's that? Uh, oh yeah, the south. That's where my mom's from. Yeah, San Marlete. Um, so wow. I was just curious if you had spent some time there and if you were as famous as Efren is there. <laughs> a lot, a lot of, um, a lot of time there and they, they have no clue of who I am actually. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. I mean, if I did some commercial music, they probably would have, but I'm, I'm only, uh, in the nerdy world of, of, uh, scratch DJs and stuff. Yeah. So let's, um, let's move forward from there. And, and, uh, when did you get started DJing? Um, I mean, 85, 1985, 85. Uh, yes, I was 15 years old. Is that when you got your first set of decks and your first, first mixer and everything was 15? I mean, we, there was, everybody had turntables at that time. Nobody had tape. I mean, I'm sorry. Nobody had uh, CDs yet. And, uh, or MP3s and all that. It was just all, everybody had, everybody in the world had turntables at that time. So 
Yeah. It was just normal. But yeah, and and for you, I mean, growing up in that time, I mean, you know, it's pretty early in sort of like the, you know, what now we would sort of consider the DJ movement or whatever. I mean, you're saying a lot of people had turntables, obviously, in your circle they did. But um, but what was your inspiration? What got you to uh, to pick up the deck in the first place? <laughs> Um, just, that just sounds funny. Um, <laughs> I, uh, what do you call it? It was the breakdancing, the breakdancing movement that everybody was, um, listening to this kind of rap music and we didn't know it was called hip hop yet. It was just, uh, we didn't know it was just this thing, this phenomenon from New York. And then it's LA started having this electronic electro, uh, music and, and there was a lot of guys popping and stuff and, and they were breakdancing and, and it was like, what is all this? this? What is this stuff? You know, it's like the most amazing stuff. And um, of course, then you heard scratching and it was like, what's what's that now? What is this? And of course, the graffiti and all this stuff. It was just all this big culture that we didn't really realize. And it was like, uh, oh, damn, this is a uh, uh, this is this was hip hop. And um, and just to hear that scratching to, to actually do it. And I thought it was just moving the needle across the record. Rick, 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 rick. And then somebody showed me, no, you move the record back and forth and you play with the sounds. And I was like, I was like, whoa, that is the weirdest thing ever. <laughs> and um, that's just, it just, it was all in fun, all in fun and just doing it just because you're a kid and just discovering kid stuff. Well, it's really cool. Like I always like listening to these stories, you know, we had uh, DJ Rob Swift on the show once and, you know, it, same kind of thing, you know, he, he was right there in that era when all this stuff was budding and blossoming and, both Mike and I are, are from Idaho. and Well, I'm from Idaho originally, but he lives there. And uh, we sort of grew up in that era too, but we also were sort of hearing this stuff sort of second or third hand, right? We weren't getting it from the Bronx or from New York City, but rather we were hearing it. I was an artist, and so I was really involved in sort of like the graffiti scene. And I remember, you know, I'd get a hold of these old VHS tapes and everything of the, the guys out, you know, hitting trains and everything at night. And then they would cut in, you know, footage of these like B-boys, you know, dancing and the DJs playing and all that stuff. And for me, I mean, it was a mind blower, right? But I mean, I, I lived in a part of the country where it just wasn't around. And uh, and so it was really cool. So I love to hear these old stories like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we didn't even uh, see a movie yet. It was a, it was a, a, a magazine. My friend had brought the school a magazine. Like, look at these guys, they're, they're lacing up their shoes weird. And, and they have these zippers on their pants that open up and, and zippers on the side of the jacket that opens up to a different color. And it was just like, wow, what is this? They had the weird bandanas and, and they're dancing all crazy. And it, it was just, it was all about that, that music that was, that was, that was new to us. And um, it was like, we're living in outer space or something now. Like, whoa, what is all this shit? Very futuristic. Yeah. At that so, time. so it's very, I mean, as a 15 year old kid to be able to pick up and, and start teaching yourself these kind of techniques that, Really, it's not like you could jump on the internet and say, "Hey, I'm going to learn how to do a two-click flare and or you know whatever you're trying to learn." You had to listen to it, figure it out, analyze it, put it together, and you're really kind of the pioneers of a lot of the technique techniques that are still being used today, and that people are trying to learn from your videos that you you made. So, um, can you maybe talk about the early years of how you kind of figured this stuff out, and then like, I mean. Did you just go to a show and see? I know you did a battle in high school with Mixmaster Mike. Was is that kind of like the the early years for you? And you're still kind of learning, and you're pulling off the guys like him. Yeah, uh, you know, we, we listened to the music on the records, and it was like we're trying to copy what they were doing. And then Mixmaster Mike had started, um, I think, uh, half a year before I did, and he was he was already well into it, and he's he's just a natural musician. And then I was always watching him, like, how are you doing this stuff? And he was just so, he had a lot of finesse and stuff. And, I, and, and he was just like, yeah, you just got to use the force, you know, what, 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 what. And then I said, what, uh, what's the secret? And he goes, there is no, the, the main secret is make up your fucking own rules. There's no rules. <laughs> Be original. That's the fucking rules. Be original. And from that, I was like, all right, I'm making up my own rules then. And that was it right there. Love well, it. so to that end, you mentioned Mixmaster Mike being, you know, sort of naturally musical. I mean, would you consider yourself naturally musical or was this your, I guess, license to just go nuts and do your thing? Uh, no, definitely. I started off, I had to crawl before I could walk and I was tripping everywhere and I'm still learning right now. But um, after about two years, I started getting the feeling like, oh, there it is. I, I feel it. Oh, it's a freaking musical instrument. Hello. Because I was just doing it like just, you know, dig, 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 you know very stiff. And I didn't know to make melodies until maybe like two years into it. I was like, oh, and then I was getting it. I was like, oh, shit. 
it's uh, you gotta you gotta just feel it and, and give it that 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 funk, you know. And so that just came uh, on accident after two years of just playing around. Yeah, I love that. Well, and I think that that's probably the case for so many people in those early days, especially, right? I mean, there was no blueprint, right? I mean, Mike mentioned earlier, you know, that I mean, you couldn't go to YouTube or anything, right? I mean, this was all all being innovated as you guys went. And so I think it's particularly cool. And, you know, I, I with you especially, I, I think that you were sort of a, maybe a little bit on the vanguard of the people who were putting this stuff on tape and sharing those ideas with people on mass. You know, I mean, actually, it's funny, uh, back in the early, early days when I had just met Mike, uh, he traded me out. I was a graphic designer. And so he traded me out with some work for a set of like American DJ decks. And, uh, so, but I, I didn't know what else to do. So I, I came across a copy of your DVD that was, uh, you know, how to learn to scratch, you know? <laughs> and so, so okay, I mean, you, 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 know, you were basically my teacher back then. Wow. 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 Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I still have the images of you wearing these like, uh, just insane masks, like the, the <laughs> yeah, yeah, mask yeah. and all this stuff. Like, I don't know if you remember the tape. I don't remember the name of it, but, um, I do but, yourself scratching. Yeah. And so, uh, so no, I just love it, but it was really funny. So when Mike told me that this interview was coming up, I was just like, Oh my God, like, you know, I've got this thing. And I think actually Mike has the DVD now. Yeah. I, think wow. I, do. I tried to track it down, but it's buried in a crate somewhere so I can find it. But, yeah, yeah. um, so was that battle with, with mix master Mike in high school, your first battle battle? Was that like the first? Absolutely. Battle? Well, uh, it depends if you, if you count like, uh, going to people's houses and battling them or like, you know, that was also about like, every time I would go to somebody's house, they were like, Oh, I DJ. Oh, really? You DJ too? Oh, let's go to your house. We'd go to the house, just be like, Me and me and that guy. We just, or and maybe he had a homie there. He'd have like a a system there, you know, there's a radio in the front, tape deck in the front, and the turntable on top. And uh, I saw this guy had a knob, a, a volume knob, and he looked fret, 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 <laughs> fret, fret. I was like, Wow, he freaking, I can't do that. Because all I knew how to do was move the record back and forth. And so that was like, That would have been my first battle. Just Oops. going to people's houses. I don't, have no, I, I don't even know his name and shit. Yeah, there, there's a guy that I've seen a video of a dude scratching with his thumb on a tape deck. And I don't know. He takes the, the case off and the, and the tape's exposed. And he'll beat juggle with the play button and the and the tapes. And oh, I that's, that's, that's my boy, uh, uh, DJ Ramsey's. Uh, I forgot his uh, Ramsey's, uh, uh, the, the turn table list. Yeah, I, it blew my mind when I saw that. I'm like, no freaking way. That's ridiculous. Yeah, it was like he and his brother... Uh, can do other stuff like he can juggle it and do chase, chase juggling like what shortcut does on the turntables, but on tape decks he does it. That's crazy. So it's like uh, <laughs> those are the two best guys in the world, and they're freaking brothers. That's insane. All right, so, all right, so let's talk about so let's um, about, uh, true. So like it, it was uh, what is it? Um, I think it was called uh, F FM twenty, and that was with the Apollo and Mixmaster. And then yeah, uh, Apollo and Mixmaster Mike and myself, and then it was two rappers, FMD and H2O. Love it. Uh, do you still have footage of those early days? Did, is there any of it? I do. Around? I do somewhere lying around. Yeah, we should we should scoop that up and put that out. Yeah. Um, so is that did that group is that what involved into the Invisible Scratch Pickles? Is is that kind of how that all formed, or was it the, like a, a separation and then you all came back? So in the very beginning, before FM20, uh, before FM20 had formed, there was a mix master Mike and Apollo. They were uh, the first two two band turntable guys on two turntables, and they would juggle on two turntables with two DJs. And um, you know they would hey 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 with uh, two DJs. It was super advanced. This was back in '86, uh, I believe '87. And um, now they were called TWS together with Style Mix Master Mike and Apollo. And then I, I came in uh, around ninety, around nineteen ninety, and uh, we became uh, the uh, what were we called? We were the DJs for uh, for our rap group. We were called the um, Shadow of the Prophet because like we were it. behind the Prophet. The Prophets were the MCs. You know, the Public Enemy had, Enemy had just came out. And they had a song called um, Prophets of Rage. Yeah. So then we became just the DJs. We were the Shadow of the Prophet, <laughs> and the, <laughs> and then we. Um, we met uh, a DJ who had, whose name was DJ Shadow, also from the Bay. Nice. And he was like, I kind of got that name already. I'm like, ah, damn it. Okay, so we got to <laughs> change our name. So we changed our name. to we didn't have a name. So we did a show in New York. And uh, Crazy Legs from Rocksteady Crew saw us. And he goes, yo, 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 you guys got to be down with us. You guys, you guys got to be Rocksteady. We need DJs. You guys be Rocksteady Crew DJs. And so we became the Rocksteady DJs. And so we entered the uh, um, the DMC as the Rocksteady DJs, and we became the first team um, to win. 
and we're called uh, Rocksteady DJs. And Crazy Lake started recruiting other DJs around the world, like, oh, I want you guys to be Rocksteady. And there became a big old, all these Rocksteady DJs all over the world. And we were like, dude, we just lost our identity. So we had to rename ourselves the Invisible Scratch Pickles. Okay. So um, you brought up the DMCs. Um, how long had the DMCs been around before you guys entered? Was I, I don't know the exact uh, date they started. I think I heard 1985. They had first started 1986 or 85. So you were within the first oh. decade for sure. Um, so, yeah, 1991 is when I first got into it. And you you won it uh, as the crew or did you win it individually? Uh, yeah, I was uh, the U.S. champion for 1991 and then I took second. I almost won it uh, in a 1991 world competition. I took second in that. So uh, that... That was a big lesson right there. It was like, top me, man, don't take it for granted. You got to practice all the time. Yeah. So um, after that, it was like, uh, then the next year, they said, hey, we're going to we're gonna try to experiment something. You can have more than, up. you can have up to three DJs for, for a team. At, at, and we're like, oh, shit, we already do that. And so we got lucky and kind of won in that sense. So did they have a, a separate category for the teams? No. Okay. No. It was just, that was, you can battle as one DJ, two or three at the most. Okay. That's that's cool. That's interesting. Yeah, very cool. Now, I love yeah. all this stuff. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about just sort of the innovation, right? We talked earlier about, uh, you know, DVDs and, and YouTube videos and stuff like that. But like, I mean, when did you know it was time to take this show to the masses? Like, what was it inside you that inspired you to start teaching others? Uh, well, uh, before I started teaching, I was doing, a, I did a movie called Wave Twisters, the movie, which is a, uh, the first ever animated hip hop movie. And then after that, I was like, you know what, we got to, um, I think during, maybe about the same time, I was like, um, I had learned something from some guru and he said, the more you teach people, the more it'll come back to you. So I was like, oh, you know what, I've, I want it to come back to me because I want to learn. So um, I started teaching and stuff and I freaking started learning too. Like, like other stuff would come at me, you know, the universe was kind of gifting me for gifting others. So I was like, oh shit, this is awesome. So like. Oh, I, I, kept, I still teach right now, so it's, it's always good. Anybody ask me a question, I give you the freaking answer all the time. So love that. Yeah, so no, that's, that's a spiritual thing. So that uh, animated movie, um, I noticed that you're very like your logo behind you right now, and the beetle, and and your website, and everything that's out there. It's very you're doing a lot of animations and a lot of graphic work. It, do you do that yourself, or do you ha hire other people to put it together for you? I, I try to do as much as possible get the top of the line, guys. I mean, I, can, I my tag is okay, but it's nothing like this guy, uh, East Three, who does the the letters. He's also he was a, a part of the Rock City crew. Um, he was like the graffiti artist for the Rock City crew. And there's also Doug One because he does it all the, the and I mean, what do you call it? the characters in our movies? He does our logo. He's like a a crazy genius in um in art and he does uh, uh, uh what do you call it? he has a company called morning breath and so he did all the characters in the movie wave twisters he did my last album uh origins my other album too uh, extraterrestrial and uh, we work with other artists like mars one and we love freaking art so it's just that's just you know well and yeah and i think it's, it's part of that culture right i mean it's it's sort of that i mean really rolled into that whole hip-hop hip scene was the you know dance as an art uh you know music as an art you know, everything is basically an art form in that in that sort of realm. So I, I don't think it's any surprise that you know you sort of stuck with the uh, the street style art. I wondered if you'd talk a little bit you, about you know, or just a little bit more about the sort of the innovation it took to take your things, you know, your your process and your scratching and everything to the streets. I mean, we were talking about it earlier about how you know just I mean for people in parts of the city, you know, parts of the country that maybe weren't you know living in New York or on the coast. Um, you know, it was really challenging to find this kind of content or this kind of information. And I think it was, you know, as I mentioned, it was really innovative of you to go to like DVD and things like that. But I mean, there obviously had to be some innovation at that time too, because we weren't streaming, we weren't doing any of that stuff, you know? So like, how are you able to, I guess, sort of convey all that you had learned and package it up in such a way that is, I guess, so cognizant of brand and other things like that, where, you know, maybe not everybody sits and thinks about their brand, you know, they're just out there doing music. But I mean, looking at like Thud Rumble and all the things you've got going on, like, I mean, there's a very established brand behind Cuber. Uh, I mean, you know, well, going back to the uh, getting our stuff out before the internet, it was a part of the culture was uh, before the internet was uh, uh, VHSs. And a part of that culture was called dubbing the fuck out of tapes and giving them out <laughs> selling. <laughs> you know, 
And just that's <laughs> that's it. Just straight fuck, go ahead, dump that shit. It's free. Boom, 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 boom. And it just got out to everybody. You know, like if you just want the raw shit, you gotta dub that shit. Boom, boom, boom. I want to, I want to copy, make me a copy, boom, boom, boom. And fucking that's it. That's how you learn shit. And if, you know, if there's a will, there's a way to get it. And so everything was just you gotta have two VHSs, boom, boom, boom. Everybody did. And that's how you got the uh, information out. Well, uh, speaking of VHSs, let's uh, let's go back to July twenty seventh, nineteen ninety six. Um, X Men versus the Scratch Pickles. Um, the footage of that is on VHS. You can hear the fuzz of it, and um, that to me is probably one of the best battles I've ever seen in my life. I don't think there's anything out there better, um, especially with the technology you had at the time. Um, I know recently everyone kind of got together and they just did a. a, a they played it and everyone talked about the battle and this and that. And unfortunately for me, I, I wasn't able to tune in a, is that available where people can go and listen to it and B, on YouTube. Uh, the actual conversation. Yes. And it's also on my Twitch and YouTube. Sweet. Uh, we will put links in our show notes. Uh, can you maybe talk a little bit about that, that battle and how you would prepare for it? And um, did you guys, had, had had you seen any of the routines from the X-Men before? Did you just go into it without knowing them hardly at all and what they're going to do? I noticed that you, um, like you started off with LL Cool J's Rock the Bells. And I was kind of wondering if that was like a subtle kind of stick it to them because they're from New York and you're from the, the West Coast. And then later on, it, I, I think Rock Raider came back and did a, a disc with Brass Monkey at some point. Um, it, it, I know it's all in jest and fun and games, but was there some animosity in that at, at the time? No animosity for me whatsoever. It was all about just straight up b-boy fucking, I'm going to fuck you up on the turntables. If it was a fight in the street, I'd get my ass whooped. <laughs> <laughs> on, the, on the turntables, let's go, motherfucker. Yeah. You know, so it was like, that was, that, was, that was it. It was the fight was on the turntables, but in person, it was like, what's up, my brother? I can't wait to fuck you up on the turntables. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I highly recommend anyone who hasn't seen it, go and watch that video. It's one of the coolest battles you'll ever see. So. Yeah, the, the only reason why I use uh, Rock the Bells right there is because Rock Raider had just went on, and I have a little part right before I do the Rock the Bells routine where it says, uh, Rock Raider. Oh, okay. You know, that's, all, that's the only reason why I just came out. I was like, oh, shit, my chest. <laughs> let me let me go. Let me get him because I got some for him. So I was like, I was like, uh, you know, when you have the, the fucking pit bulls, I was like, let me out the cage. I was like one of those guys in the group. Well, I know that, uh, so like Rob Swift, for example, he, he does the brolic army stuff and with all of his students, he teaches them to juggle with rock the bells. And so I, I knew that there was some kind of like, you know, meaning behind that song with them. Um, but I, I didn't know if there was like some, you know, kind of a diss in there or something that, that so yeah, just, just at the beginning, it says, uh, um, what's it called, uh, rock Raider. can't scratch. No, 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 no. It just was just the, the thing to scratch at that time. So um, one of the, the, the hot buttons in the DJ community is the, the you know, the switch over from vinyl to Serato mm -hmm. and Serato to the 62 with cue points and loops and all the different things that you used to have to do with. Like if you're using a, a battle record, you'd actually have to make a loop with a piece of tape and set cue points on the vinyl and this and that. And in the battle scene, um, I know that, you know, it's, the advent of Serato and the switch over from that to, to, you know, going from vinyl to Serato, there was kind of a hot minute there where people weren't really kind of behind the, the tech. And, and it took a little while to get everyone kind of on board and DMCs only started using Serato, I, I think right around when the 57 came out. Um, can you maybe talk through that time period and how the technology advanced the game and how maybe it kind of, you know, some people, I mean, like there's a, always the button, the sync button conversation that always stirs shit up with DJs. I mean, it, the, can you maybe break that down in the battle world for, for, you know, like your experience with that? I mean, at first, at first it was like, I'm hardcore, fuck that. It's all about records and shit, you know? And then after a while, I was like, hey, this, this is kind of cool. You don't have to bring all these records to the show and you can do certain things that if you want to use vinyl, just press a button and use fucking vinyl. What the fuck? You can use both at the same time. So I was like, oh shit, this is kind of, you got a best of both worlds in there. So it's like, a, um, it was, it was definite advantage when you discover that, yeah, use it all. What the fuck? You know, it's like, it's like saying, um, it's like saying, uh, uh, man, fuck these laundry machines, man. I got a scrub machine. That's the real way, man. Fuck that. 
Fuck these others, man. It's about running two sticks together, man. Fuck that. You know, so why does he use it to his, uh, his advantage and shit? Yeah. Your fuck ass is all about using your feet, man. <laughs> So I want to talk to you a little bit about sort of the the business of the DJ, right? So, I mean, as you have grown up and, and evolved, I mean, obviously we all start out as scrappy young people doing our thing, but at some point we got to pay some bills. Maybe we got a family to raise. Maybe we got a house payment to make and we got to start evolving from strictly having fun to, you know, having fun and getting paid for it. You know, uh, I mean, with a lot of these hip hop guys, you know, they're pretty, pretty scrappy, pretty good at kind of hustling up some dough and kind of making it work. But I mean, as I alluded to earlier with, uh, you know, sort of the brand discussion, I mean, you, you've you really developed a beautiful business around this thing. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about just like your DJ career as you matured, as you sort of moved past the 25 year old, you know, uh, DJ battle or even the 30 year old battle. And now all of a sudden you're you know, 41. And I, I don't know what your family situation's like, but, you know, I mean, as you're starting to sort of face real life, uh, you know, responsibilities, you know, how did, how did that evolve you or how did that change? And did you have any role models or, right? or was this all sort of foreign ground to you? You know, I, I read a book at a very young age. It was called, um, I was into like spacecraft UFO shit. And then, um, I still am actually, and there's a <laughs> book called, uh, the lost teachings of Atlantis. And I had learned about Atlantis from a young age that there was this uh, freaking futuristic place that was more advanced than our world now, of course. And uh, so I was reading through the Atlantis book and I was like, oh shit, it says here, there's no such thing as money. It's all about um, what you put out in the universe, the universe knows to give it back to you. It's like we're in this big giant video game of God's mind or whatever the universe's mind. And if it's a big, a big video game, it knows exactly what you deserve. So the more, beauty you put out you have gifts like we're all born to be superheroes every single one of us has a superpower to make the world a better place and when you realize that when you use that superpower to to make everybody happy it just fucking comes back to you your bills get paid miraculously and all this shit it's, it's amazing so i was like oh fuck i'm gonna keep on putting shit out and I fucking that's what it was i got bills so i'm gonna keep on putting shit out and it fucking works i put out shit for free artists ask me what you know, how much you know, how much you charge? I say, I'll do it for free if I like the art, if I like the rap, if I like the, the song, I'll scratch on it for free. If it's whack, I'll, I will charge you because I don't, I don't really want to do art this whack. But if it's, if it's beautiful and, and it, it's awesome, I'll, I'll get involved. And I never charge people. I just put it out. I do it, everything for free and it all comes back to me every fucking single time. And then when I stop and I get lazy and I'll fucking do some other shit, everything fucking falls apart. But it, when I use my superpowers and I fucking practice, and I, I fucking make shit, teach people, uh, whatever, do a routine or make the mix, a mixtape, put out a break record, scratch on somebody's shit. Everything just goes up, fucking just skyrockets. So I'm like, that's all? I just got to do what I love? It's like just the most amazing thing. It's like you don't even have to worry about money if you're doing what you love and making people happy. Yeah, I love that. What a, what a cool message. And like, I mean, as a philosophy, I think that's a beautiful thing, right? I mean, this idea of give more than you take and you know, and that the university or universe will sort of pay it back, you know, like I wouldn't consider it. Knows. It's, it's intelligent and shit. It's fucking, it's fucking more intelligent than us. And shit. So, yeah, I love yeah. that. Well, I mean, uh, and like, you know, I wouldn't consider myself particularly sp spiritual, but I can sort of second exactly what you're saying. You know, I mean, as a, as a young freelancer, especially, you know, I work in marketing and design and, you know, as a young guy, I mean, that was kind of my rap, you know, just sort of put out into the universe that I need work or that I need something to do. And it would just sort of always manifest. You know, and not right. to get too woo-woo or anything, but I think that that's a, a really great philosophy. And it's really fun that you learned it out of that book. I got so lucky reading that. I was like, oh, damn, it was all meant to be and stuff. And, and you can see, if you guys don't believe in an intelligent universe, just walk around nature. You'll see all the freaking plants are fucking geometric shapes. Those are all Fibonacci sequences everywhere. That's high mathematics. So you have to realize that there's something out there that's way more intelligent than us making all this stuff everywhere. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I, I can relate to that as well. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been wondering how I'm going to make my next car payment. And all of a sudden I book a wedding and it the problem solved. And, and it, it's weird yeah. how it, it's every single time almost. Um, it's almost as if the universe is, is laughing at you like, man, let me see if this guy's going to do something. If he doesn't, well, I, we ain't going to pay his bills. But if he does something, we'll figure <laughs> out a way to drop some money on him somewhere. He'll find it in the street. Oh, he's doing his shit. Here's a thousand bucks. He's going to find it uh, fucking under a cardboard box. And you go, oh shit, what the fuck? Or something <laughs> will happen. You get a gig out of nowhere if you're just doing the right thing. You know, it's just the weirdest shit all the time. Yeah. Don't believe me. Do your shit. Don't believe me and fucking just waste time. You'll see what happens. <laughs> so, um, well, I love that. Any, anytime we think we've got it all figured out, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty simple. You know, they, they, 
It was like feist, like fucking Santa Claus. He knows if you're naughty or nice. It's just amazing. Yeah. So you recently just did a collaboration with uh, the Mile High guys um, with the uh, scratch vinyl. Is that Serato DBS? Is that what that is? It's a uh, Serato record with our logo on the record, and it shit, it just sold out in minutes. It was amazing. So we're gonna do a new a new one coming out uh, real soon. So um, can you really talk about the like the first scratch record you put out, like the process of you know, pressing it to vinyl, getting it printed, going and finding the uh, person to make it for you, getting the copies and actually distributing it. Cause that's, that's a whole game in and of itself. And you're one of the, the top guys in it. So if you could break that down. I mean, you know, it, it, that goes back to like, uh, uh, as a young kid, I, I was always taught seeking, you will find asking you shall receive. So it's like, fuck, all right, I'm gonna look for, how do you make these Records, I'm going to ask, where do you get the record covers done? You just ask and all the answers will come to you. You just got to be patient and, and just keep doing the hunting and, you know, you'll find it. But but really, really there's all these record companies. You just type it in, um, record companies that make vinyl. You, now you just do it online and shit. So it's, uh, it's a lot faster. But yes, um, you know, we wanted to keep, we love hip hop. Hip hop has the graffiti and it's, we made a, a lot of the artwork has some art on it. And uh, the music is just like what? What kind of record do you want? I remember we used to be in a record pool and we would look, listen, we get all these records in the record pool. We listen to all these sounds and it's like, that's a waste of vinyl. There's nothing on there. And it's like, why would they make a record when there's no, no sounds on here? So we're like, let's just make a record with all the fucking dopest sounds on here. And that's how we made our first records. That was just the mentality. So did you, when you were going into these battles, um, would you custom press a piece of vinyl specifically for that battle? And you'd have the routine kind of choreographed and queued up, ready to go. Yeah, like uh, half of the battle parts would be actual records, and some parts of the battle would be like we probably going to need a, a record that has a few sounds on it, so we don't have to throw a bunch of records on. And you know, so yeah, it's kind of like that. And we we did get a lot of people like, "Hey, you're cheating!" <laughs> Fuck it, it's the, it's the magic trick. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, I mean, you have the resource, you might as well use it. So, yeah, um, that's what magicians do, right? So, I know so that there's, there's been sort of a recurring. Oh, go ahead, Mike. Oh, um, I've seen a video of making like a, a Serato pre formatted, uh, like scratch sample uh, track where you can actually choreograph it where every quarter or 16th of the record uh, you have another sample jumping up. Um, have you? Did you take that in, into consideration at that time, or was that something you just kind of spaced it a second apart and then went from there? Or did you actually go into that mechanical depth to to break it up? Uh, it, it, we already knew that already. Like it would be dope if this sound came after that. Then after that, go into a chorus. You're gonna need this sound right after that. You're gonna go into the bridge. So you're gonna need that sound, and then you just turn the record back twice and you come back to the first chorus and that type of shit. And then solo sound will be right before that. Of course, yeah. Now, did you ever have any weird issues with the pressing where it would come back and, and shit was just off? Millions of times. Yeah, we learned a lot of lessons. Uh, like, I was trying to figure out how to make the record um, uh, uh, skipless, you know, like uh, to skip on beat. Uh -huh. And we're like, what's the, te what's the freaking tempo of that, <laughs> of the record? And it was uh, right in front of my eyes. It was the, 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 the turntable spins at 33 and a third. third so like, yeah. oh. I never, it took me so many, maybe over a year to figure it out. It was like 33 and a third beats per minute will get you exactly on the hello. So that was a, a revelation right there. Yeah. Um, it, it's amazing. Like people don't realize how much is involved in doing the type of stuff that good, real, really good DJs like yourself do. Um, I, that's why I'm bringing this type of stuff up because a, a lot of our listeners aren't DJs. We're a creativity podcast. Ryan's a graphic designer. I'm a DJ. And we thought that there was a lot of similarities in between our careers. And so I'm bringing this up, not necessarily for the people who listen to us as DJs, but for the people who are like graphic designers or business owners. And really, and I, I want them to realize how much goes into doing what you do or real quality DJs do. Um, I mean, yes, like a, it's like being a magician, right? Like I'm, I was saying earlier, like you don't realize all the freaking process, all the mechanics into that freaking magic trick. But on stage, it just looks like, you know, something's disappearing or whatever real easy, but really there's all this other shit going on that you're not seeing and all the practice and all the uh, the training and the skills 
required it. And then the ingenuity is it's some nutty, nutty shit. I mean, it's like magician, musician. It's almost the same word and shit. So all you artists out there are within magicians too. So, you know, the same shit. Well, and especially now, right? I mean, you know, with technology and all this other stuff, I mean, they don't remember, you know, or never had the experience of, you know, having to put tape on a piece of vinyl, you know, like, I mean, everything is just, you know, you chop it up and you can do it on your phone practically now, you know, and, you know, not to yeah, say that there isn't some, di- you know, there's definitely some difference between the top level performers and the kid doing it on their phone. But, uh, yeah. you know, the point is technology has made this much more accessible to people than it's ever been. And so I think sometimes it's really good to, I guess, sort of hear about the struggle, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Going back to that, they're called tricks. Yeah. Well, cool. So one of the things I wanted to get into with you, and I mean, you know, we've we've talked about it over and over again, is this idea of sort of innovation and your role in sort of doing what's next. And uh, I I know that you are sort of involved in this NFT movement. You're, uh, you know, pushing some artwork that way. And, uh, you know, for people who don't know, the NFTs are are non-fungible tokens. They're essentially uh, a crypto back, you know, asset of some variety. So it could be a, an image or a video or a, a clip of music or whatever. I mean, it can be just about anything. But but uh, I wonder if you talk a little bit about that. Now, obviously, you didn't create this technology, but it's still, you know, another example of you sort of on the vanguard of what's next. And so I wonder if you talk a little bit about what that's all about and how it's going for you. I mean, you know, we're doing it for fun. You know, we, we, all these, there's all these collectors that collect our records and collect the other things that we make and toys that we make and whatever. And so these, these NFTs... Uh, and we're like, hey, let's, let's make some collectible NFTs too. So we have my my movie Wave Twisters has like 18 characters on my last album. Uh, my last album is called Origin. So every song is a an origin of each character. And we're like, let's make these each of these characters little um, NFTs. So, so that's what we're doing now. It's on rarible.com slash wave twisters. And uh, so far, um, the first, I think the first, we've only been in it for two weeks and a lot of the stuff has already disappeared now. So we're just putting up new stuff. We're gonna actually gonna post something tomorrow. Uh, Thursday, Thursday and Sunday, we put up new characters and then just they pretty much fly out of there. But it's really interesting, and and we've only been in it for a few days, and people are gifting me with things, and and I'm getting these weird tokens. Uh, like I got the very uh, from this guy. Um, I think his name is Rare Skrilla, and he was one of the first guys to make a, an NFT with sound on it. Uh, this was back in 2014, I believe. And it, it's called a, it's called a rare Pepe, you know the, the character, the Pepe character. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. And then he made uh one 2014. He, he made this thing called the DJ Pepe, <laughs> and the DJ Pepe happened to be me. With but he put the Pepe face over my face, but it ha- it's me scratching my body. I have the original picture, uh-huh. and um, he gifted that to me. And I was like, oh cool, what is this? And my boy goes, yo, dude, that's that shit is worth a hundred thousand dollars in Bitcoin. <laughs> I'm like, what the. F- Shit, I'm keeping it. So anyway, <laughs> if you go on my page, you can see it. It's, it's there. It's, it's pretty cool. But yeah, it's like, whoa, this this world is something else. So I was, I'm like, let's, let's let's make some collectible things. And and so we're doing like, a, we have this one record called a Super Seal record. It's the most our top selling uh, scratch yep. record called Super yep. Seal. And so uh, yes, just yesterday we were like, let's make the fucking Pepe Super Super Seal Pepe. So tomorrow we're gonna release this. Uh, limited edition super seal with a Pepe guy's face over the seal. That's awesome. Oh, awesome. And well, comes and with so, super seal Pepe record. <laughs> so what role do you, do you think this plays in your career? Like, I mean, are you finding that you're starting to cross over now or sort of blend the, the lines between just being known as a DJ and then people, you know, you, you mentioned toys that you make, other things like that, other merch. I mean, you know, your apparel line is cool on its own. Like, I mean, are you finding that there's more crossover? Maybe people who don't even... I, I mean, maybe know you from the before time, but these guys are the guys that are, you know, they're following your your latest release of NFT or your latest toy drop or your latest whatever. Or are you finding that they're all just sort of OG fans that have always supported you? It's both. There's OG fans, there's new fans, and there's like, um, there's just, it's all everything, everything in between. It's just, you know, we put out something, we might do this year, next month, next week we might be working on fucking whatever, some virtual reality shit. And uh, we're working on uh, another robot and maybe we're going to do another, the prequel to the movie, all this stuff, animation, this and everything, whatever. So it doesn't matter. It's like just whatever goes with, um, to make the world a better place with what we know best. And, and, and like, if I, if I was, if I was uh, somebody like into this stuff and it'd be like, I would love to have a freaking whatever. Uh, I don't know. Fucking blow up doll that scratches. I don't know. Just let's make it there. <laughs> you know, whatever, anything that's fucking amazing that would be that would be cool. 
Well, and I love it too, because it's, it's, I guess, again, it's just so hip hop, right? I mean, just like yes, the graffiti the kids the or the roots. b-boys or the whatever, you know, this is the latest technology, but ultimately it's still just an expression, right? This is just how you're sort of, you know, uh, you're pimping the way that you think about the world or the way that you sort of, you know, uh, address things. And so I, I think it's a, it's a really cool and innovative way of doing it, but I think it's just so indicative of your character throughout. It's just no fucking rules. I'm making up my own rules and then I just, just having fun with it. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But we got 20 million other projects anyway. So it's like, we're just testing stuff. We're, we're throwing darts and at, at, at seeing what sticks. You know what I mean? It's like, just throw out all the fucking darts and shit. I'd like to do that. Let's do it. Let's fucking do it. Let's make it. Oh, boom, boom, boom. Let's go. Let's go. Let's make it all and, and just have fun with it. And But like, but the roots is the fucking the b-boy shit. Where's the skills? Let's see. Let's, let me see if you can fucking kill it on the scratch. You know, I still got guys that are like, um, you know, what's up with the, with the cuts? That's my roots. I will fucking practice every fucking day, no matter what, if I'm doing whatever, doing this and that. If I'm farming a fucking graffiti, uh, whatever, <laughs> uh, crop circle, <laughs> and, and letters on the ground, I'm still going to go back home and scratch shit, so whatever. Yeah. yeah, no, I love that. Well, and I think too that, you know, I mean, exactly what you're describing, you you landed on a point that I think is particularly salient and important for people, which is basically this idea, don't be afraid to fail. You know, I mean, I think for a lot of people, you know, and maybe this is just really indicative of being a DJ, right? And and especially in an era when you're sort of breaking new, wall, you know, boundaries, but there are probably plenty, plenty of guys that picked up those tables and couldn't get it right or couldn't find a beat or whatever and just walked away. You know, I mean, but there's there's something to your character. So maybe you could talk about that a little bit. I don't know if you've got any pointers or anything, but, you know, outside of the sort of platitude, just, you know, never say die and just go, you know, I mean, oh, is there man, anything there's that there's you could share with people? At the gym, when I was a kid, before I was DJing at the gym, luckily I saw this and it was uh, the guy, the world record, the world record uh, uh, stolen bases in baseball. Oh, wow. He has the world record for also getting the most tagged out. Oh, that's true. <laughs> so I, I was like, you. okay, it's it's shit. I'm, gonna, I'm every time I fucking lose a battle, I I fucking learn something. So I was looking forward to losing every time. So I was like, I don't care who I battle, I'm gonna learn something, and that was the main thing. So I didn't care about losing. That's the pussy shit. I don't give a fuck that. I'm gonna learn something, which is more important for everyone, because I'm doing it for everyone, you know, to and to make myself better. To to you know, yeah. yeah. So you think if you're gonna lose a battle, but learn something, let's go there. Because that's more think, important to, to get the knowledge. Yeah. Do you think there's anything to being sort of the child of an Im- immigrant family that maybe led to that sort of that bit of character in your life? You know, like maybe things just weren't so perfect or maybe you saw the struggle your parents endured or something. And it, it gave you the, I guess, sort of the the opportunity to think in the way that you're thinking. Because I don't know that it comes so naturally to everybody to, you know, be willing to sort of try and fail and 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 have that philosophy of learn from every every failure. I got very lucky. My I had two very strange parents. My mother uh, was a valedictorian in high school, a valedictorian in, in her university. So she was always a winner, winner mentality, and she was also she was the queen of recruiting in Mary Kay Cosmetics for five years in a row, four or five years in a row, and she would always go to Dallas and get crowned by Mary Kay herself. <laughs> and she was always playing these freaking tapes. Uh, Anthony Robbins and uh, Zig Ziglar. Yeah, and, all the good and, ones. And it, always the freaking that would go in my head. And, like I would get ready, get dressed, get ready for school, get ready to cut school, <laughs> and I'd be listening to these uh, these tapes. You're the best. You can do it. You can do anything. Whatever you put your mind to, you can do it. There's no rules. You're the boss. You can put. You make up your own world. It's like it, the the sky's the limit. You are the fucking. You're part of God. God flows through you. All this shit was going in my head. As I was getting ready to um, not go to school and, and sweep in the parking lot, um, <laughs> and, and it was it was that was an accidental thing right there. So that's one thing. So I have I learned from that that hey, you just whatever you tell yourself, if, if you tell yourself that you can do it, then you can fucking do it. And that's it. You just gotta always tell yourself that like I can do it. I can do it. I I am the best. You are the best. Every single one of you is the best because God's flowing through you. So every single one of you is part of God. So it's like hey, bro. Recognize that you can do whatever you want. And then my dad, my dad was a a, a, a rebel. He was the opposite, uh, and he would he would do he would go against the rules. Like he would. Uh, I remember he was a uh, um, an altar boy at the church, and uh, they would collect the money. They would collect all the money at the church. It was all peaceful. Yeah, thank you, thank you. They would go, and every after everybody would leave the church, 
The priest would just take the money and fucking spend it on himself. And he was like, what? What's going on here? And so it was like, oh, shit, it's a big trick. It's a big magic trick. And my mother also showed me a magic trick, but she, she was a pharmacist. So she was she was a pharmacist. And she, oh, my God, all of this shit is poison. Every, all of this, all these drugs will make you sick so that you can keep buying the drugs. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, this fucking magic trick's everywhere. And so they made me think a certain way where it's like, wait a minute, what about if you do things this way instead? So I was a very, my mind was uh, uh, looking at everything in a different way. As everyone was looking with the tunnel vision, I would step out of the tunnel and be like, well, what if it was really like this? My whole life was a what if. And I was always collecting these Marvel comic books. And then there, there, was, there was these what if. Remember those what if comic books? They were called what if. I'm not, and they had like, what if Spider-Man was a woman, all this stuff. And it's just all these different things. And so my whole my whole style is, what if you did this? What if you did that? Well, what if you did this? What if what if people are listening to it like this? Maybe you want to make a sound like, you know, all this stuff. So, uh, yeah, my parents had a big influence me on that uh, to think a certain way that everyone else didn't think. And I was, that was a, that was a very lucky thing for me. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I love that. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. yeah I, I just, I think it's so important for people to hear that. And obviously, you know, I'm speaking in generalizations about the plight of the immigrant and that kind of thing. But, uh, but I, I definitely think there's some, you know, some, something and intangible that comes from people who endure that sort of thing and make a big change, you know, to come from their homeland to a place like this. And, yeah. you know, I think, uh, I think those characteristics are really valuable and I can tell that, I mean, what they imparted on you is curiosity. And, and I would argue that that's maybe one of the, you know, most valuable traits that somebody could work on is developing a curiosity for things. Yeah, and it's just yeah. Once again, it goes back to yeah, make up your own rules. And so it's, it's it's like theater, right? This whole thing is is a uh, we're in a big place. So make up your own character. What what is that character? You know, <laughs> you know, it's, it's gonna definitely. Uh, we all have that power to be original and unique. So yeah, just develop that character, and, and it's what what you are. You know, because it's so every single one of us is like uh, you know, like once again a superhero. Freaking, you're a Green Lantern. This guy's a Superman. That guy's a Flash. It's so different. So unique uh, possibilities within yourself that is, is so amazing. Yeah. Um, I want to step back to what you said about the battles and how you learn from, from each failure in a battle. And uh, I just I wanted to share my experience of the same thing. I've, I've only been in two battles. I started off as a wedding DJ, so battles weren't kind of my thing. I just was literally I was the guy that had the, um, you know, the pre-made playlist and just let it do its thing because it was corporate world and weddings and actual mixing wasn't really in my forte until Serato came out. And then I realized that you can man manipulate the MP3 and this and that. And it, it just kind of changed the game for me. And I was actually to the point of where I was just going to do um, lighting and corporate gigs again and, and not even focus on DJing anymore. I was just going to go into the corporate world. And then when Serato came out, I was like, this is fun again. I want to do this. And recently, yeah. um, the last battle I did uh, was with, uh, it was in Salt Lake. Rob Swift was the judge. Mr. Sinister was one of the judges. And ah. So coming in from never being in a battle to having them as judges, that was the most terrifying oh. thing <laughs> that I have ever done in my life, right? And yes, I was yes, yes. so like I, I come out and I um I like I, I put a pretty cool first routine together. Like I, I pre-planned it and had a lot of uh, spent a lot of time working on it. And I wasn't taking into consideration that I might make it to the second round. <laughs> I made it to the second round and my, my second set was just completely ah. bad. <laughs> and so, ah. so that was a very important lesson for me was to make sure you have material for both sets in case you get through the first round. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So, I mean, I, I too have been down that road where, you know, going out, stepping off that ledge and, and doing that kind of show, um, I learned a ton and I learned how to kind of put a routine together and I learned how to do shit that I never uh, even tried before just because, hey, I'm, I'm going to step out in front of 100 people and I can either look like a piece of shit or I can actually, you know, do something with it. So I spent a lot of time working on that first set, but I didn't think I'd go through the second one. And I, I, I wasn't very impressed with my second one. So um, that's a good lesson. Yeah. I just wanted to share that. But um, another thing I wanted to ask you about is uh, the importance of a crew. Um, what it's like 
you know, because I've, I've, I'm the solo guy. Like, I've never been in a part of a bunch of guys. And I didn't even realize that hip hop in general was a community aspect and where it comes from and how, it, you know, um, the origins of it are community and the DJs portion as well as community. So I didn't realize how important the community of DJs is and having, you know, four or five guys like a track and mix master Mike and shortcut and all these guys to listen and see what you're doing and giving you feedback and be able to pull from them and saying, Hey, I like this, but you should try this or, you know, Hey, what the fuck was that? You know, and, and just kind of seeing what they're doing and, and being able to, not cop their style, but learn from them. Um, can you maybe break down how important it is to have that community and have that crew to to talk with and build from? Yeah, I mean, you know, they always say uh, two heads are better than one. So if you have more, of course, the more geniuses you have in the in the group, you're gonna learn a whole lot of shit. You're gonna have the hardcore guys be straight up with you, like, yo, that's whack, don't do that. <laughs> and it's like, well, and you learn fast, fast, like, don't fucking do that, it's whack as fuck, you look stupid, boom, 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 all this shit, it's better like this, what if you did like this, ooh, ooh, let me take that combo, I'm gonna fucking do this, wow, ooh, like, I'm gonna combine it with this, boom, boom, boom. Man, you can have so many gazillion combinations, your, your crew is gonna make you excel super fast because of because of these freaking intelligent people around you, so that's that's very, very, very important. You know, don't be like, don't be an asshole and be like, oh, I don't want to be around him. Fuck that shit. No, man, you, you gotta, you gotta fucking take the, take, learn, be a, always, be a student. Like I'm always gonna be a student. Like I don't care if I fucking get my ass kicked. I wanna, I wanna fucking, I wanna get that black eye so I know and fucking dodge it next time and shit. You know, it's like that's what it is with, with, with DJ. It's, it's all these guys have a million ideas and it, it's like class. And stuff, and so you have to humble yourself to be, to be always learning, open to uh, to that. And it was like boxing. We were we were in a gym. We were fucking, we were just boxing. Like, yo, let's look at this guy. Well, let's watch this guy's tape. Check it out. Boom, boom, boom. We'll study this guy's videotape and be like, oh shit, let's take that idea and fucking put it with ours and mix it up. You know, it's not not just our ideas, but we're studying everyone. We were like, we're a scientist. Like, look at let's watch let's watch the, this next battle. Look at that. Look at this guy. Don't ever do that because that shit looks stupid. Or that's whack. Oh, he sucks. But look at that one little trick he's doing right there. Holy shit. Let's take that and fucking do that in reverse now. And shit. It's like so many different combinations of, 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 of things you can do. Or like, that's been done. Look at this guy doing the same shit as that other guy. That guy, dude, why are they fucking doing the same shit? I'm never going to do that because 20 people, like two people have done that. I'm not even going to do it. Or even one guy has done that. I'm not going to do it. So you just always got to be a couple steps above if you're going to copy someone's shit. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, so many aspects. Yeah. Well, and I, I love the way that you put that because I mean, you know, it really is in the DNA of hip hop to, uh, to be, you know, collaborative and to be working together. I mean, you know, even if you just break it down to the fact that, you know, DJs are perpetually sampling music and breaking, you know, uh, mixing beats and, and grabbing things and being inspired from different things. And, you know, I mean, the whole thing really is a collaboration, right? So, I mean, to be the solo hip hop artist would actually be kind of a weird move, I think. And so, uh, so I think it's important because, you know, I mean, a lot of our conversation so far has been around sort of personal philosophies and things like that, but I think it's critical to think about, you know, the philosophy of working with others and how the uh, the collaborative process works. Because, I mean, you know, like you say, I mean, the the best work gets done when you've got people there to, uh, you know, to sort of, I guess, beat you down if you're not doing the right thing. Yeah, definitely, you got to have that. And you know, it's good. It's solo is good too. But then also, there's collab collaboration, and there's uh, you know, what's after battling? Collaboration. Yeah. You know, it's like the opposite and shit, right? So it's like it's. It, all of the all the things, battling, going solo, collab, fucking all this shit, teaching. It's like all those categories are, are a beautiful thing. You're gonna learn something from all of that. So try it all. Yeah. If you want. I'm just that's just my world. I, I like trying it all. And it's like, oh shit, I learned something from all those aspects. Yeah, well, I can I think there's something to that for sure. I can tell you one thing's for sure. Um, I learned more actually cut coming out of the, you know, the the basement and trying to do everything myself and teach, you know, learn from your videos and, and different training things just by coming out and going to um, there's a, a group in Seattle called the scratch lounge. And I don't know if you know, beach beat molester and those guys um, I used to do a, a monthly show at Trinity or a, a get together. And really it was just, you know, a cipher. And the, uh, the first, I don't know, six months, I just went and I watched 
I, I didn't even want to even jump on or do anything. And um, I remember specifically the first time that I jumped on the decks and beat molesters right across from me, killing it with the joystick on a 57. And it's just like, oh my God, like the bug eyed. And, and it just opened a whole new world of like talent and things that were out there. And, and it, um, that, that to me was like a game changer for wanting to practice even harder and going harder and, and learning this Ooh. and doing that. And, um, I, I would recommend that anyone that's, you know, the, the basement DJ that's trying to learn how to do this, go out and hang out with other DJs that are doing it and they're better than you, you know? I mean, yeah, that's another thing is, you know, you're, you're killing it. And then when you get in front of an audience, can you do the same thing or yeah. better than the, the audience? Because there's another energy there like, oh shit, I better not fuck out. <laughs> and so you gotta get rid of that and just be like free and shit. Like, I don't give a fuck, what's that? Yeah. You, know, you, you, you ever uh, you ever still get like the the heart palpitations or the goosebumps and the nerves kick in and you're like oh crap and then for me I noticed it was like the battle I did with uh, uh, Mr. Sinister and Rob um, I don't even remember the battle I don't even it felt like it was two seconds like it went from you know I hit play and all of a sudden it's over you know and it was like <laughs> oh, what did I do <laughs> yeah so there's a um. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, now I've learned when you get nervous, that's because you fucking didn't practice. That's it. Yeah. For me, yeah. when I practice, I'm up there. I don't give a fuck what's up. Yeah, motherfucker. <laughs> so it's like that's that's the confidence because you fucking train hard. But when I don't practice and I'm I'm fucking like I go to a show and I didn't get enough rest, I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> you know, you, that's that's it. So before a show, I make sure I have the promoter fly me there a day before. I have my turntable set up in the room so I can practice a little bit before the show and then I'm all good. But if I get to a show and I don't practice, this is just for me. Some people are different. They could just, I don't gotta practice. They're fucking killing it. But for me, I need to train right before I go on. So uh, like I, I noticed a lot when I used to do a lot of band stuff, a lot of the guitarists before the show, they're practicing like crazy before the show and stuff. And so I, 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 would, I would have to do that. And then when I get up on stage, it's like, I don't even gotta look at the turntables. I'm talking, what's up y'all? Scratch at the same time. You know, it's, it's like, it's it's a, it's a supreme once again confidence when you when you train hard. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Well, and I think that's a great thing to point out too, because I think a lot of people, you know, we feel pretty good about the work that we're doing, but I think you know the, that putting in that little bit extra, I think, is sort of what separates kind of the. I guess the men from the boys or whatever, right? The the professionals from the people who aren't, uh, regardless of whether you're a DJ or whatever, you know. I mean, whatever it is you happen to be applying your your energy to, uh, you know. I think taking that time to actually reflect and and practice and you know put in the work, you know, is obviously going to prepare you for the day. I mean, yeah, it's it's for me, it's, it's physical. I'm an athlete. I uh, stretching is an is athletic. I'll stretch. I'll eat the right foods. I'll drink a lot of uh, water. I'll bless my water. All kinds of stuff that goes on behind the scenes. That, that has to do with health, just so I could have my chakras open and clear it so my third eye, my pineal gland is open to the universe so I could fucking put it up. I love and that. With God and shit, you know, like it's corny as hell, but I do it for real, so that's real shit. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Well, hey man, as we're starting to get to the end of this thing, I wonder if, you know, you've got any sort of parting shots or if you just want to leave off with where people can learn more about you and, and what you're up to and maybe what the future uh, holds for you. Uh, right now, I have a new album coming out. I just came out with my last album, Origins, uh, in uh, the beginning of the year, December, actually. Um, and uh, it's free on djcuber.com. I'm coming out with a new album called Wave Twisters, The Lost Encounters. And that's going to have a bunch of new characters and stuff. And, and all these characters, you can see them on our, on our NFT collection, um, rarible.com slash wave twisters. Once again, uh, my company, Thud Bumble, on ThudBumble.com, and I, I put all the updates and everything I'm doing is on my um, Instagram, at DJ Cubert, and sometimes at least once or twice a week I'm on Twitch, twitch.tv slash DJ Cubert, and um, what else is there? And if you want the inside scoop of everything, like the first, first dips of everything, it's um, uh, uh, on my Discord. If you just go on my, my, uh, my Twitter, at DJ Cubert, and you'll see an invite to the Discord. And you see everybody talking about what's what's coming up next with the um, with everything. That's kind of where it first starts, and then it goes filters out to Instagram and Facebook and all that. YouTube. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you, thank you so much, man, for taking the time to do this. I mean, you know, incredible conversation. Fun to you know hear about all that history and everything. But I think we passed on some nice philosophy too. I dig it. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, that, those are the important things I want to get out to people because sometimes I'll talk about, yeah, I did this, I did that, but what can you have people, you know, like take away when you're saying the philosophy stuff? That is the shit that helped me the most, which is you help people, it comes back to you, boom. Love it, love it. So, well, thank you so much. Um, I know. Thank you guys, thank you guys. Yeah. Um, so, Ryan, you want to close yep. us out here? Yeah, man. So, th- you know, like uh, like said, and we've said a couple times now, thanks so much for show- uh, coming on the show. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your evening to do Thank this, you. Uh, you know, and making time for us this uh, this evening. Uh, you know, I-, I really appreciate all you've done for the the industry. I never became much of a scratch artist myself, but I, I do appreciate the uh, the good times from the DVD way back in the day. So, but uh, <laughs> thanks so much for everything. And, uh, and we'll talk to you uh, again some other time. Sure, we'll do it again. No problem. All right. Sounds good. And thanks, everybody who tunes in this week and every week. And we'll see you next time. Everybody in the building, give it up for DJ Cuber.